And this thing is freaking crazy. It blew my mind. It was literally boiling water within a few minutes. Hey everyone, this is gonna be a follow-up video to a previous video where I made a hot water heat exchanger to make hot water from a wood stove. In this video, I'm gonna be making a rocket stove that I can use with the same heat exchanger to test and compare against the system using a more traditional wood stove, and I'll be able to compare things like how long it takes to heat water, how much fuel it uses, the incoming and outgoing water temperatures, and things like that, so I can really start to dial it in and make a really efficient wood-fired water heating system. So if you haven't seen them already, make sure you check out the videos where I make the hot water heat exchanger, and also the video where I design and make a really efficient traditional wood stove. Some of the parts of this video will make more sense if you watch that video first, and there's also a video where I address a lot of the questions and comments left on that first heating coil video. So with this rocket stove, I'm optimizing to get really high temperatures with a low amount of fuel and have the heat applied directly to a heating coil. I'm shooting to get temperatures between 1200 and 1500 degrees Fahrenheit because at that point I can get a really efficient burn, but the copper pipe in the heat exchanger is so close to those high temperatures that I'm afraid if I got too much hotter than that, I might nuke the copper. This is solely about testing and getting the most out of the heating coil that I can. This isn't part of a big thermal mass system. It's not meant to be a complex design. I'm not trying to capture every last bit of heat out of it. The point of these experiments is to get hot water as fast as you can with as little fuel as you can for things like showers or small scale agriculture or even in-floor heating in off-grid cabins. I'm also going to be building it out of steel, so it'll have quite a limited life. If you want to look into building a long-term rocket stove system, you don't want to use steel. You want to look into using either refractory cement or fire brick, things like that. So with that out of the way, I'm going to get into the build. If you have any thoughts or questions, throw them down in the comments below. And remember, likes and subscribes really help the channel, or you can directly help us over on Patreon. I'll start by getting the basic parts for the body of the rocket stove marked out cut up, scored, and bent into shape. Now I'll just weld up all the seams and get the parts assembled together. The pieces are all six inch square, and so this is just a basic L open on both ends, and then there's just the feed tube that gets welded onto the end. All right, so this is the basic rocket stove, and one thing I'll mention is that if this was a standalone system, this riser would need to be a good bit taller, probably about double the height that it is now. But because I'm gonna be hooking this up to the heat exchanger and then another 10 feet of flue on top of that, this will be just fine for this purpose. Now I'll get started on the outer shell that'll hold the insulation in place. Here I'm just making a collar adapter to go from the six inch square to a standard six inch round flue pipe. The stove will have a detachable leg system, so here I'm just making some sockets that legs can slide into. I made four, but only ended up using three of them. For the legs, I'm using one inch solid square bar. Oh. 
I'll just add two holes so I can insert probes and take some temperature readings. Okay, it's all set up for the initial test. I've got the temperature probes ready and set up. I've got a piece of extra flue in case I need to throw it on there for some extra draft, and it's ready to go, so. All right, it's starting to rocket. 10 minutes in and it's over 1500 degrees in the bottom chamber. Okay, I'm gonna call this working pretty well. So I'm gonna let this fire die, let it cool off and go hook it up to the water heater. All right, we're all set, so here we go. And that draft happens a lot faster with this stack on it. Okay, so it's five minutes in. At about four minutes, I had to choke the system down because it started sending boiling water out. This thing is so much hotter. It's 2000 degrees here at the bottom and it's 800 degrees here at the top. The water's up to 50 degrees and it started a little bit lower at 43 and it's 82 degrees coming out of the hose. It's at 2100 degrees choked down at seven minutes in. Okay, 15 minutes in, I've been able to take off the choke so it's flowing at full rate now, but I was able to size up quite a bit on the logs. Okay, 30 minutes in and we have 1225 at the bottom. I'm trying to dial it in and I'm gonna attempt to ride around 13, 1400 degrees. And just so you can see right here, we're getting some pretty screaming red hot temperatures. So just for fun, I'm gonna check the temperature in the actual stove. So this is gonna be a complete burn. We're over at 1700 degrees already and it's still going up a little bit. So basically I've cracked all the carbons. This thing is burning every last volatile there is. So, and it's riding right around 1700 degrees. Well, and the probe is bright red. And we're just coming up on 35 minutes now. We've got 1275 right here. We've got 640 at the top, 180 degrees at the hose and 103 degrees at the barrel. So that is over temperature. So that's the test up to the 100 degrees and this is definitely faster. I actually went up to 140 degrees in the previous test and I just didn't go that far in the data in that video, but I'm gonna take this up to 140 degrees also. So I'm just gonna keep going with the readings and see how long it takes. Okay, so 45 minutes and we're at 1250 at the bottom, 600 up at the top. And then I have turned up the pump just to keep the water coming out at a reasonable temperature, which is 160 degrees. And we're at 122 in the barrel. The pump was on the lowest speed for the entire time in the first test, which I think is 11 liters per minute. I'll double check that. And then the highest speed is 53 liters a minute. And I've had to go up to that speed just to prevent this from coming out too hot potentially dangerous that I don't want to be around, but increasing this, that speed has dropped this down to a reasonable temperature. Okay, 55 minutes in and we've got still 1200 degrees here at the bottom and 141 degrees in the barrel. Okay, so I'm gonna call that good and start shutting down this fire. Once I get this taken apart, I'll jump inside and start going over all the data. That test was awesome and it blew my mind how powerful the rocket stove was. It was even a little bit scary at certain points. And I want to caution, this can be extremely dangerous from scalding hot water to explosions from overpressure events. And I would definitely recommend that you don't try it unless you really know what you're doing. First, the setup. So the rocket stove was easily reaching 17 or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was essentially cracking all the carbon molecules and basically burning all the volatiles. It was probably getting combustion efficiencies in the high 90%. At points it was really too hot and I had to choke down the system and speed up the flow of water just to avoid a dangerous situation. This is also why I included a pump in the system. With the flip of a switch I was able to increase the flow of the water from 21 liters per minute to 53 liters per minute and essentially stop the boiling instantly. If this had been running just on a thermosiphon, I wouldn't have had any power to increase the flow of water and the pressure and the heat could have continued to build into a dangerous situation. Also, the bottom damper made it possible to really quickly cut the flow of heat to the coil and that also helped cool the system down. Now I'll quickly compare the creosote buildup from the two different systems. So here's the heating coil after each fire and surprisingly the wood stove actually had less creosote on the coil. The rocket stove had more creosote but it was more powdery and wiped off really easily whereas the wood stove creosote was a little gummier and took quite a bit of scrubbing to get it off. And just to show you this is after I cleaned the copper coil after the wood stove fire and before the rocket stove fire. Okay, let's get into some numbers. I'll post all the data and charts over on Patreon for those who really wanna dig into it, but here's a basic breakdown. 
As you can see in the charts, the rocket stove got up to temperature way faster, even boiling water within a few minutes of lighting the stove. The wood stove took a lot longer, which is in part because it's optimized to burn efficiently in a normal setting. So I might build a wood stove that's specifically optimized for outdoor water heating, and that should help a lot, but the rocket stove is just always going to be better here. The rocket stove can also reach much higher temperatures as you can see, and with a really well designed system with sufficient safety mechanisms like pressure relief valves and automatic temperature adjustments, it would probably be possible to make an instant water heater with a rocket stove, but the danger factor would be so much higher and it's probably beyond the scope of most DIY situations to do safely. But as you can also see, the rocket stove was wasting a lot more heat as the exit temperatures were much higher than the wood stove. If the system was also designed to capture that heat, like in a rocket mass heating system, it'd be fine, but in a simple system like this, it's just a waste of energy and a loss of efficiency. Now looking at the charts of the water temperatures, the first thing you can see validates that the rocket stove heated the water way faster. 55 minutes versus 95 minutes. So if really quick hot water is the goal, then the rocket stove is the obvious way to go. It was also able to reach much higher temperature outputs, so again, it's a win for the rocket stove. The wood stove did heat the water quite well and needed far less tending, so if there's no rush, the wood stove would be the lower maintenance option. Once the stoves settled in, they were both able to create pretty stable temperatures that could be optimized for in the heating coil design. Now onto efficiency. There are quite a few assumptions I had to make to do these calculations. For example, we don't have a mass flow rate of the flue gases, but I really tried to be as accurate as possible and make realistic assumptions. Both systems heated 106 liters of water from about 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The wood stove took 95 minutes and used just under eight pounds of larch wood. This equates to a roughly 33% efficiency rate. The rocket stove took 55 minutes and used just under nine pounds of large, which equates to about a 30% efficiency rate. So while the rocket stove was certainly more efficient in actually converting the wood to heat, it was just too powerful for this system. The flue gases were moving just way too fast, leading to more wasted heat out of the flue and a lower efficiency rate. So either a much longer heat exchanger or a totally different design would be needed to take advantage of the strengths of the rocket stove. And just to note, I also included the small amount of gasoline I used in a chainsaw just to come up with a comprehensive efficiency evaluation. Now let's compare these efficiency numbers to standard water heaters you'll find in average homes today. First, electric water heaters claim to have about a 90% efficiency rate. But once you take into account things like sourcing, mining, and transporting fuel used to make electricity, like coal, natural gas, or uranium, then actually making the electricity and getting it to your house, including all the infrastructure that takes, the actual efficiencies are more like 30%. Average natural gas water heaters claim to be about 65%, with high efficiency versions getting into the 85 or 90% range. But then again, once you factor in everything it takes to drill for and extract the natural gas, to transport it, the shipping, the pipelines, the trucking, by the time it gets to your house, the actual number is closer to 45% efficiency. So time for some conclusions. I think the rocket stove was just too powerful for this heating coil design. It used about the same amount of wood as the traditional wood stove, but it converted it to heat almost twice as fast, meaning it was almost twice as powerful. This allowed the water to get just too hot for this setup, including boiling the water several times, creating unsafe temperatures and pressures. That's not to say that a rocket stove wouldn't be great at converting wood to heat and heating water. With their high efficiency rate, they're actually perfect for this. I just think the water heating system should be further down the line of a rocket mass heating system after the flue gases have passed through some more stable matter like cob, clay, or sand and brought the temperatures down to a more manageable range. The coil in this design was also far too short. As you can see, there were still very high temps exiting the flue and just going to waste. The wood stove was actually pretty good, I thought. It maintained very hot but manageable temperatures, far less waste heat was exiting the flue, and I didn't need to be present nearly as much as with the rocket stove. There's still a lot of bugs to work out for a long-term regular use unit, and I don't think I'd ever trust a system like this inside a house. But I think there's a lot of promise, and I'll continue to explore it. In terms of the hot tub or a large volume of water outside, I think the wood stove was better. 
I spent a lot more time chopping wood down to the right diameter and feeding and tending the rocket stove. With the wood stove, I could just walk away for a couple hours at a time. But the rocket stove would heat a hot tub up much faster, say a couple hours, whereas the wood stove might take a whole afternoon. But with the wood stove, I could be busy doing other work and only check on it a couple times throughout the whole day. Of course, you could modify designs to help with some of these issues, and I can't wait to hear from you guys some of the things you did to overcome these challenges. I love all the comments and questions from you guys. They're really insightful, and there were some really great ideas in there, so keep those coming. I'll be back with more designs and tests. I've got a brand new take on a design that as far as I know has never been done before. I've already begun to source parts for it and that video will be out as soon as I can build it and test it. It addresses a lot of the issues on this build like creosote, galvanic corrosion, and friction from the thermal expansion of the metals. So I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching and take care.